Hi there everyone, Rob McGregor here for our end of April edition of On Track. I'm recording this on Friday morning, the 29th of May. It's a beautiful day on the Sunshine Coast. We've certainly seen uh, the temperature drop, um, but we've been spoilt with some good weather to enjoy during lockdown. Lots going on as always, and I'll walk you through it. So firstly, as always, general advice warning, this presentation is designed for clients of McGregor Wealth Management. It may be useful to others, but before acting on anything in, in this presentation, you should seek out advice of your own. What we're going to cover today, we're going to look at some of the economic news. It, look, it's all still dominated by coronavirus and the path out. I'm going to put it in context as usual in today's special analysis. I'm going to talk about the maths of investing in the economy, and, and this is really important. Um, I'm going to talk through the market updates for the key markets, particularly those that make up the portfolio, and as always, attempt to put it in perspective. Look, the news, as I said, is still dominated by the virus. You've got countries like Australia, New Zealand that have smashed it, and we pretty much have not just flattened the curves, we, we've completed the curve all the way down. You've got some countries that have flattened the curve, but they haven't reduced it, and that's probably most of Europe, US and the UK. And then you've got some of the countries that were late to the, the party, so to speak, um, Brazil, etc., where they're still climbing the curve. Now, the media loves to point the camera at whatever is the worst thing going. So right now they're pointing at Brazil. And keep in mind, whatever they're pointing at is the worst of the worst. So they are in no way attempting to give you a proper analysis of what's going on. If they can find body bags spread out in a park, that's what they're going to point the camera on so that it makes us feel like the whole of Brazil is body bags. Now, of course, that's not the case. It's not taking away the seriousness of it all, but just that reminder that the media finds the worst stuff that, that, that is happening in the world, and then they find the worst angle of that, and that's what they point the camera at. So it's, it's far from being a fair view, and the media has lost all interest in giving us uh, a balanced view. So there will be lots of bad economic news coming up, and I'm just wanting to prepare you for that. We are absolutely in a recession. We're already there, and I'll, I'll touch on what that means. Um, and, and it's factored into the market, into the investment world. The challenge we have is when the media starts reporting on it as the news comes up, it'll feel like to the average investor that it's a surprise, but it won't be a surprise. The market already knows we're in a deep recession. We don't quite know exactly how we come out of it, but looking at the market action the last few days, I think the market is reasonably optimistic. Um, talk briefly on the path out being planned. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time except to say we are planning a path out, which is good for everything. Look, the biggest challenge for the world is, you know, it's hard to see any signs of crowds at the footy or big events um, or global travel for a while yet. And, and the impact that will have on the economy. A lot of us will switch our spending on those things to other things, internal travel. And I think we're gonna see a boom in internal travel. I think we're gonna see a Pacific bubble. Um, and these are not any secrets, it's just interpreting the news. Um, and instead of going to Europe, we'll possibly be going to places like Broome, Tassie, um, Port Douglas, or other you know, places that we Australians tend to leave to last. Um, or, or not travel to as much. We've definitely got more stimulus to come. We've saw talk this week from the Prime Minister about the next stage um, of, of you know, employment stimulus lease, which will be job maker. And he's called for a truce on industrial relation reform. Um, they've scrapped some, some sort of reform that the unions didn't like. It looks like they're gonna get the unions to the the table. And this is Morrison attempting his Bob Hawke moment. It's extremely clever. If he gets it right, he will stamp himself down as, as one of our greatest leaders. There's a lot of work to be done to do that, but he's got them started. And if the experience of the National Cabinet is anything to go by, um, he's pretty much going to roll that National Cabinet into this industrial relations reform and attempt to squeeze more money out of what's going in. So Morrison's approach through this um, which I quite like, just from the economic point of view, is to make sure that the dollars being spent are being spent wisely, not just on pink bats. If you recall the stimulus from the GFC, it was just get money out there, get it spent. So he's want to make sure it gets spent on jobs and it get, comes through and then people will spend that money. So it's ambitious um, and fingers crossed, hopefully it, it works well. 
as we look across the, the yeah the Pacific to the US, it's a bit of a black comedy going on. Uh, I don't know how else to put it. Um, we've got a presidential race this year. It's going to be a farce. Um, yeah, Trump's becoming more erratic and appealing to the extremes by the day. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit of a yeah, a black comedy. Um, we're just thankful that the US system is so robust and no no leaders can dramatically influence it. So I suspect we're going to have a very tight presidential race and I suspect the, the Americans will split the Senate, which means you know, major things, major reforms can't be done. But we'll watch with interest and who knows how to even predict um, what's going to happen there. And as always, the trillion dollar question, how do we come out of lockdown? What happens next? Um, it doesn't matter too much. We've seen economies survive for a lot of us life has gone on fairly well. I mean, my, and don't quote me on these numbers, but my, my feeling is that the, the people that are unemployed or whose businesses are doing badly or on JobKeeper might account for about 20 to 25% of the population. And for those people, yeah, an, an economic downturn like this is bad, but it's not as bad as it normally is because of all the stimulus. So people, instead of being unemployed or on JobKeeper, and even those on unemployment benefits are getting that extra 550 a fortnight. So yeah, there's still people struggling, don't get me wrong, but it's it's probably the best crisis ever to be on that struggle path, except for those that have fallen between the cracks. And the media has been very good at pointing that out, as has the union movement, and I'm not going to go into that in this forum. So we've got 20, 20 to 25% of people struggling. We've got the vast masses, call it 40, yeah, 40 to 45%, who are doing fine. They've still got their jobs, they're working from home, they've still got their normal pay. Life's actually costing them less. The interest rates are lower, petrol prices are dramatically down, they're not traveling, so they've got money. And for most of the masses, they're spending it. They're spending it at Bunnings on home renovations, they've built their home gyms. Um, as soon as the economy opens up, they'll be taking holidays to Byron Bay, hopefully to Noosa. If, um, if we open up the Queensland economy, which my belief is we'd be madness not to, with some caution, of course, um, and I'm predicting a backflip from that probably around about the time you're listening to this or in the next few days, um, it would be crazy for us not to open our borders to some travel for in time for the July school holidays, but we'll watch and see. Um, so back to the numbers. Yeah, so the 40 to 50% of the masses who are doing fine. And then you've got 30% of the economy that's actually doing really well. So these are people that have responded well or they're in areas that have had a boom, take away food where they've got it right, online deliveries. Australia Post is having record numbers, you know, keeping up with online deliveries. So there is a part of the economy that's actually doing very well. Um, I'll talk through some economic figures um, shortly. Um, and they will be bad, but they're as expected given the own goal or the self-imposed um, recession that we've put ourselves into. As, a, as always, that reminder from Warren Buffett, yeah, when, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. We've actually passed the moment of fear. Markets have bounced back reasonably well, um, but it's good to remember um, to be contrary. Uh, just a quick reminder of those four pillars that make up our care philosophy and then I'm going to dive into a couple of those. The philosophy and the implementation of it through the care um, portfolios has held up very well through this. It's been extremely true to label um, and I'll talk more about that as I get to the portfolios. Um, but we've been, you know, we, we, we don't love negative times but we've been less negative than, than most and for most of our clients they're in a zone where it's, it's kind of almost sideways and down a little. Um, and the only ones that are down, so that, that sort of 10% range are those that are high growth, younger investors who are dollar cost averaging. So yeah, that's a good thing because they're buying every month. They're certainly not selling. Uh, but the key to this is always starting with your plan and that, that, that key learning on history that I talk about so much. And I'm gonna add some more of that today. Um, making smart decisions. So that number two there, managing our behavior is so critical. And when we manage those three, we just do it professionally and you know, as per what we would call modern portfolio theory, nicely diversified portfolios, rebalance regularly, uh, and that gives us um, predictable, relatively predictable and consistent results um, as the tide goes in and out. That market context again, we talk about boom, bust, wall of worry or fear, 
There's the bust, FOMO, those are the emotions, but most of the time we're in the wall of worry. We've had, this was the quickest bust in history, um, and I'll show you more about the actual numbers, um, and it's one of the quickest recoveries in history, and that's because of the nature of this. This wasn't caused by a financial crisis or a financial boom, it was caused by a self-imposed lockdown. So it, you know, it's, it's, it was never gonna be as big as previous crisis where there was um, financial excesses, the boom in the lead up to the bust. This is how most investors mess it up. As you know, I won't go into them all. I'm gonna look at, um, you know, as always, this, is, this has become the biggest exercise in short-term focus and single issue obsessions. The fact that pretty much every conversation is, is you know, the, the greeting, how you're going in lockdown has, you know, everything's about coronavirus. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about um, history in a minute and diversification again, but as always, beware. The media, the number one there, uh, not the great the greatest place to get your advice from. So let's have a look at that psychology and I've added our, our dashboard. So each each month the, the GPS Investment Committee puts our stamp on where we think the market's at. So we think, to give you the, the heads up, that we're in that cheap to fair range. Fair value is very hard to determine in a market like this because fair value is determined by the economy and by earnings that individual companies and each market will make. So at the moment, analysts are busy trying to look beyond this to see where earnings are. So we're being fairly conservative on those earnings. So if earnings you know, are fairly subdued and predictable, then the market's kind of cheap to fair. If earnings rise back rapidly in response to the economy's opening, then the market's probably cheaper than we're showing here. And if we had unexpected bad news that smashed company earnings worse than expected, and I'll reiterate, that's worse than expected. So bad news isn't bad on its own for the markets. It's only bad when it's worse than expected. So if we had earnings from companies that was worse than expected, then that might push the markets back down a little bit. And they have had a good run. Just a reminder, the drop we had, and it was almost the quickest drop in history, was 36.5% during March, bottoming on March the 23rd. And for the ASX 200, it bottomed at 4546. Um, Interestingly, one year ago today, the market was 6.392. So the, the market's down 8.4% over a year. Now that doesn't even put it in into the top, um, you know, the top, well, wouldn't put it in the top 10 worst years. It might put it in the top 20 just. It's certainly one of the worst corrections. But assuming, you know, when we close the books on this financial year, um, at June 30, that the market's up a bit more, we might find we're only down about 5% for the, for, the, for the whole year, so which will be quite remarkable. Um, I found this chart a couple of months ago. I ordered, um, you'll see a new chart when you come in the office, which is the equivalent of the index chart that we have for Australian investors, which is riddled throughout this program. But this is the, the US version. They stopped making it for about a decade, and there's a company that started making it again, uh, much to my nerdy investment delight. Um, and this one, it actually goes back to 1925. So it goes back to before the depression. So you'll see that massive period of FOMO followed by the biggest bust in history in the US. We didn't bust by as much in Australia. And then the top line is US stocks. But what's interesting here, they also show diversified portfolios. So a growth portfolio in the red and a balanced portfolio. And I'll point out, that it's pretty much in line, the long-term history, with what we've always projected. So a balanced portfolio is showing return of about 8%, which is inflation plus 5%, and a growth portfolio about 9 which is inflation plus 6%, and a pure stock portfolio about, about 10%, so inflation plus 7 We've used those projections for years. So regardless of whether the market's up or down, because we know history comes back to those, those numbers over time. So when we're planning the rest of your life, it's very important that we use long-term numbers, not numbers affected by short-term movements of the tide going in and out on investing. And those numbers have held up pretty steady in our 22 years of looking after our clients, both building up to their retirement and then enjoying long retirements. So fascinating chart, you'll see that on the walls and it'll obviously be in the slides. Um, there's so much in that. We could spend an hour just talking about some of the lessons there, but I won't. I want to talk about the maths of investing before I you know, go through the, the individual markets. 
And the mass of investing is something we remind people in downturns. So what I'm showing here is if the market drops 10%, it needs to go up by more than that to get back to where it was. It needs to go up by 11%. So picture $100 in an investment drops to 90. Um, that's down 10%. It's got to go up 10 and 10 on 90 is 11%. If the market drops 20%, so if it went from $100 to $80, which is a 20% drop, it's now got to go up by 25% to get back to 100. So you'll see the more it drops, the more it has to go up. So a market that went down 33%, which is pretty close to what we did, has to go up by 50% before it's back to where it was. And a market down 50%, which is the worst of the downturns that we've seen you know, three to four times in the last century. Um, the market's got to go up 100% to get back to where it was. Now, it always does. And this is the reason, this, the, the people use statistics badly in some of this stuff. They say, oh, the market takes 10 years to recover uh, before it gets back to where it was. And that's not the point. The point is what happens from the bottom of the market. So for a market to go up 100% to get back to where it was, which it always does, the return from the bottom is quite spectacular. So for people who stayed in, their return for that next five, seven or 10 years that it takes is, is very good. So for a market to double, which is 100% in seven years, that would be a 10% return. For it to for double in five years, that would be a 20% return. For it to double in 10 years, that would be a 7% return. Um, now, in this case, we're only down about 36%. Um, so even if we... What we often see in the first year after a downturn is the market goes up by roughly the same percentage. And if I just go back a couple of pages here, you can see that we're up 28% from the bottom here. We went down 36. And I sort of always expect the market to go up in percentage terms by what it went down. So if the market went up by 36% from the bottom, it'll be just in those low 600s in terms of the ASX 200. Um, and we're actually starting to come up towards that now. So that doesn't tell us where it goes, except to say, as the index chart shows that it'll always go up. Just to point that last bullet point, if the market, if your investments were to drop 80%, you're not coming back. It's got to go up by a lot. We see this, this is why diversification is so important because the only time people lose 80% is when they've got highly focused investments, just one company or just one sector. And in every time we've had a big market downturn, there's always a sector that's copped it the most. So if you go back to the GFC, um, you know, property trusts went down. If you go back to the tech wreck, it was um, any tech companies were down 80 to 90%. It's funny, in this one, it's probably travel companies that have been smashed by the most. Um, yeah, and we'll see how they come back. Some of them won't come back, so that drags the averages down. Uh, and this is why diversification is so, so important. So I'm gonna continue on with my discussion of should we be scared of recessions? Um, because, and recessions on the index chart are the light blue lines. Um, and the market's always bottom during that. Recessions are looking in the rear vision mirror. So by the time they announce a recession, it's already, we're already in it or it's already passed because a recession by definition is two negative, two quarters, two consecutive quarters, that's three months of negative growth. Um, and as I show on the right there, GDP is actually pretty steady. Even the biggest recessions we've had, you can hardly see a blip. This one will be a bit bigger um, and we are in a recession. I'm gonna jump through, but yeah, just I'll leave that before I jump into what's likely to happen from here. The history shows that recessions are a great time to be investing. So for those people, as always, that we've talked about who are, are cashed up, it's a great time to be getting into the market. And I will point out that the market and the economy are not the same thing. You're gonna see the media announcing worst recession since the um, depression. And for some people, they'll think that's a terrible time to invest, but the market has already worked through that. And that's why the market's going up as we speak. So this is data from the IMF. So you'll see on the left-hand side is what the IMF thinks world growth will be for 2020. So there's a lot of red ink. That means we will have shrunk global economies um, by less than 3% in most cases. Um, and so, so economies down, but by as high as, as 5% sort of in some areas. Um, and there's this, you can find this on the IMF website if you're nerdy like I am and you wanna dive deeper. But needless to say, the IMF is, is, is predicting sort of you know, 3 to 4% contraction in the economy. 
Now, keep in mind, for it to get back to normal, it would have to grow about 4 to 5%, so that maths of investing. And for 2021, which is on the right, they're predicting um, you know, economies to come back by about you know, that sort of get at 5% in 2021. So that gives me some comfort that we might be back to where we were at the end of 2021 for the economy, global economy in aggregate, which means that might mean we even have, you know, if, if we're getting through to that optimistically, there's every chance we may see some, some very good share markets in the next couple of years as this data turns around. Um, the key is it's already started, by the way, when I go through the markets, you'll see that. So you'll see Australia there at the bottom, we go from, you know, they're actually predicting in 2021, 6% growth or more. Now we need that to get back to where we were because we're gonna be in that, um, you yeah, know, less than 3% growth. Um, we're actually gonna be in the, about the minus five. So 6% will get us back to where we were. Now, not every industry will share that. Some industries will come back out further ahead than where they were. Some will be, some will, will come back, some will take a long time to come back. And I'm picturing things like cruise industry. But I will leave a note there that it's amazing what a short memory we have collectively. So let me go through the key markets. Aussie market in, um, in, in April, up 9%, and it's gone up further. You can see that it's continued to go up. And in the last week as I record this, uh, it's the 29th of May, it's had a nice little run up. So yeah, we went from the, one of the worst months to one of the best months, but you'll see the top chart there is one year, and you'll see you know, the, such a big dip. The bottom chart is 10 years, and it's starting to look like you know, not too bad and just another dip when we put it into long-term context. The US shares, um, the amazing thing about US shares for us as Aussie investors is, is with the decline in the Aussie dollar against the US dollar, it's actually a positive year. So US shares for us as Aussie investors, we're actually up 13% for the last 12 months. We're up 5% for the month, and we're even up for the quarter here. Um, so it's, it's quite fascinating. Once again, it emphasizes the need for diversification. And with all of these, we pretty much call the market cheap to fair. During a crisis like this, there's, there's no high level of confidence on that because it is hard to tell what earnings will come out at. If earnings come out well, then we're very much on the cheap side of that. If earnings take a long time to bounce back, then we're probably more at fair value. I, I personally think we're on the cheaper side of that. Um, and I think if we come out of it um, well, as some of the leading economic institutions like the IMF uh, believe, um, and don't forget, economists are often wrong. So, yeah, but it's all we've got to go on. I've, I've, my philosophy is to always look at what the experts are thinking and then to critically an analyze that to make sure it's not crazy. Um, and I certainly don't think that's crazy. US small caps are looking very much like Aussie shares to a degree. They're up strongly for the month. Um, and yeah, they're up for the year as well. And yeah, the, 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 the thing with the US small caps is they're often the first part to come out of, um, the first part of the, the market to boom. And you'll see that sharp rise on the right of the chart here where they're starting to come back strongly as always. Very important part of the portfolio. Global leaders, um, one of my favorites, this has been quite spectacular. Um, you know, it's up 10% for the year. So we've got, um, yeah, and, and global leaders, as I showed you last month, includes companies like, like um, Facebook, Google, um, Amazon, the big leaders that have actually benefited and are doing quite well throughout this, also cheap to fair. Um, emerging markets have had a tougher time. So one year emerging markets is actually down. Um, and yeah, we think they're actually cheap. Um, they will come back, but they do tend to feel the pinch during a crisis more than uh, developed markets. Um, and, none that, and that creates opportunity when we look forward, which we should always be doing, and they remain an important part uh, of the portfolios. Gold has been one of the saviors, and when you know, the active portfolio, where gold sits in our care portfolios, the active portfolio is actually up six to seven percent over the last twelve months. It's partly due to the fact that gold is in it. So gold's up forty-two percent for the last year. You can see I've drawn a line across the top right. It's starting to flatten. So maybe gold curve has flattened, and gold will often 
we, we, we think gold's important for the long term, so we, we keep it in the portfolio. We don't think anyone should be too overweight gold, as the gold uh, bears are or the gold bugs, the people that think the world is always turning to dust, who always have lots of gold in their portfolio or just gold. Uh, we think it's an important hedge because it does do well when we get bad times, but we certainly don't think that's uh, all someone should have. Um, and we may see gold flatten off, but that's okay. Gold will flatten off if the rest of the portfolio is doing well. So we'll be happy to see gold flatten off, but actually be happy to see it fall. Because if it's falling, it means we believe risk is, is dropping and the rest of the portfolio will be doing well. Performance to the end of April for the portfolio, as you can see, still got negative numbers in, in six months. The, the numbers are subdued for a year. So, so the care is where we've got the C, the A and the E, the core, the active and the enhanced portfolio. So you can see a, a moderate portfolio, uh, you know, conservative portfolio just ahead, a moderate just under, a balanced portfolio just under, and growth and high growth slightly more under. Um, that's dragged down the three and five year numbers to, to slightly below a long-term target. They're not that far below when you consider inflation is pretty much non-existent at the moment. And it won't take much to push those longer term numbers back to those targets. And you never want to measure your targets in the ditch. If you're going to measure them in the ditch, you measure from ditch to ditch. So you'd go back to the bottom of the GFC. And if we went back to the bottom of the GFC to the bottom of this cycle, you'd see those returns are consistent with our long term targets. So it's been particularly pleasing that the care portfolios have delivered as per what we would expect them to do. Uh, in, a, in a crisis, so when the tide goes out, those crises are always unpredictable, but it's nice to know the portfolios respond in predictable ways. And they've held up well, um, which has meant not one of our clients had to sell any growth assets during this downturn. Property, these numbers at the end of April, they don't show much action yet. The, the, the red numbers around Perth and Darwin were already there before this crisis. It shows a little monthly change in, in, in Melbourne. It's early days. We would probably expect in the next next six to 12 months, we might see some weakness in property. Keep in mind, property indexes are based on sales. And if the only people are selling are the ones that have to sell, it's probably not a true economy, but we could say that about the share market too. But property, which is much less liquid, um, shows up those exaggerations. So you know, it's, it's not a bad time for people to be um, be buying where they're looking at investment properties. If you're changing over, it probably doesn't make too much difference. And for those that are, are looking to sell out, it's probably not a great time, except I will point out again, if you're selling property when it's still close to where it was and you go into the share market when it's down as part of your plan, you're, it's actually a really good time to do that. Interesting, our friends from Heron Todd White, and you can find their full report on their website, have actually shuffled this around quite a bit. So they've moved some places like Sydney and most of New South Wales back to a declining market. Uh, they've sort of left Melbourne um, as starting starting to recover. So it's interesting. And keep in mind, these guys, aren't, yeah, they're, they're good at what they do, but no one has a crystal ball. Um, and they've moved Sunshine Coast back as well to a rising market. And I certainly do think for those of us that live on the coast, we, we're gonna see some increases um, as, as markets come back to normal, um, partly because of the works going on here, but partly because I think people realize in a time like this, it's a, that, that certain places are, are nice to be living in. Um, and certainly the Sunshine Coast would be part of that. So yeah, some interesting observations there. The unit market is pretty much identical. Um, and yeah, as always, yell out if you're considering buying or selling and we can, we can talk about the timing where you've got the luxury of waiting to sell. I won't go through this a lot. I've been through this in the last few months and you know, I've got to say our clients are, are wonderful. Um, we haven't had any panickers whatsoever and we've had you know, most, mostly calm and predominantly people looking to yeah, stick with their plan, adjust it where they can as per these guidelines. But ultimately you don't need to adjust it. But we've seen a lot of where people are not spending as much as they thought, then we can actually throw some money into the market where we're doing that over the last month. It's already reaping some rewards. So I'll reinforce the process as I wrap up, but we, we do have plans for all our clients. They are based on the goals that are, you know, that are based on the important, important things in your life, the people and your plans. The portfolios are designed to meet those goals where we take a long-term view. 
And as always, massive diversification, get the asset allocation right and maintain enough liquidity that we never have to sell during a crisis. We do use low cost index for most growth markets. We've seen that perform particularly well. It's a very hard time to be an active manager. Can you imagine trying to work out whether Virgin's a good buy when it's down at the bottom or whether Flight Center's a good buy once it drops enough? It's it's a pretty hard game to, to do. We prefer for the most part to have um, indexes. We do use some specialist managers um, for our Australian shares and they've been busy looking for some bargains, uh, which they've done quite well. We do protect against that short-term volatility with um, the reserves and dollar cost averaging and we rebalance uh, regularly and we've done a few of those through this crisis. Um, remember those three ways to lose money and don't do them, which no one of our clients have done. Uh, panic and sell, have to sell or not properly diversified. The main reason people to do those is if they don't have a good plan and if they don't have confidence in the advice that they've got. Um, so thank you for, um, yeah, for being our clients. As always, um, we take great um, care in literally what we do for you guys. We treat it very seriously. Uh, it does keep us up at night from time to time, but the idea is it keeps us up, not you guys. Um, I wish you all the best through as winter on the sunny coast or wherever you are unfolds and look forward to seeing you probably face to face next time. Uh, we are starting to see clients in the office um, where appropriate. Um, we're very comfortable continuous Zoom meetings where appropriate as well. Have a great day. Look forward to talking soon.